It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. When it comes down to snakes, there's no doubt in my mind that there are various mixed reactions from people when it comes down to this issue. There are some people who are just simply afraid of any kind of snakes. There are some people that openly embrace snakes. And there are some people that are in the middle when it comes down to this issue. But whatever the case may be, it seems as though that the issues of snakes as tropes for literature has been really popular among the ancient world. And for this video, we're going to ask the question, what exactly was the role of the snake when it came down to ancient Mesopotamia? Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 14 and 15. He brought me to the north gate of the Lord's house, and I saw a woman sitting there crying for the false god Thomas. Then he said to me, Do you see this son of man? You will see even worse sins than this. One thing in the passage that stuck out to me was the fact that they used the word Thomas to refer to a god. So the question then becomes, what exactly are they referring to when they refer to this god? This image right here is the image of Thomas. He is also known as Dumuzid. He is the god of serpents and fertility. And on the left side is his wife. And the wife is actually Ashura, who is also known as Ishtar and Anana. Yes, you heard me correctly. Ishtar, Anana, and Ashura are the same goddesses. And yes, it's true that before Ishtar, or Ashura, became the wife of El, who later became the wife of Yahweh, she was actually the former wife of this particular god. This story is known as Dumuzis and Enkidu, in which the two couples actually get married together, but the god actually had to compete against Enkidu to get that marriage for Ishtar. Maiden, the council pen, Maiden Anada, the step full, blending in the forest, Anana, let me scroll with you, the armor, young lady, let me, I am a woman, and I won't do it, I won't, I am a star, and I won't, I won't be a wife of a shepherd. Her brother, the warrior, you, said to holy Anana, My sister, let the shepherd marry you, marry Anana, why are you unwilling? His butter is good. His milk is good. He is of good butter. He is of good milk. All the work of the shepherd's hand is splendid. Anana, let Demazu marry you. You will wear jewelry. He will wear jewels. Why are you so unwilling? His butter is good. His milk is good. All the work of the shepherd's hand is splendid. These words, the father to the shepherd, my king, the shepherd, Dumazed, to said, And what is the farmer superior to me? The farmer to me, the farmer to me. Enkidu, the man of the dikes and kennels, and what is that farmer superior to me? Let me give me his black garment, and I'll give the farmer my black eye for it. Let me give him his white gauntlet, and I'll give the farmer the white owl for it. Let me pour his best beer, and I'll pour the farmer my yellow milk for it. Let me pour his fine beer, and I will let the farmer my sore milk for it. Let me pour his beer, brew beer, and I will pour the farmer my whipped milk for it. Let me pour his beer shady, and I'll pour the farmer say milk for it. In other words, in order for Thomas to get married to Ishtar, he has to do like a dick measuring contest. Uh, how lovely. In other words, in order for Thomas to get married to Ishtar, he does a dick measuring contest. Speaking about dick measuring contests, it seems as though there's like a whole entire erotica that's dedicated to this couple. My Velva, the boat of heaven, is full of eagerness like the young moon. My unified land lies follow. As for me, Anana, who will blow my Velva? Who will plow my high field? Who will plow my wet ground? As for me, the young woman, who will plow my velva? Who will station the X there? Who will plow my velva? Make your milk sweet and stick my bridegroom. My shepherd, I will drink your fresh milk. Wild bull, Demazu, make your milk sweet and stick. I will drink your fresh milk. 
Tomu will also make two other appearances. For example, he appeared in the story that is known as the descent of Ishtar to the underworld. Sparkle Ishtar with the waters of life and brought to her sister. Let her go through the first door and gave back her the Vega. Sparkle Ishtar with the waters of life and brought her to her sister. Let her go through the first door and gave back to the proud garment of her body. Let her go through the second door and gave back the bridges of the wrists and ankles. Let her go through the third door and gave back to the gurgle of the birthstones around her waist. Let her go through the fourth door and gave back to the store nun pins at the breast. Give her back to the fifth door and gave back to her the braids around her neck. Let her go through the sixth door and gave back to the rings of her ears. Let her go through the seventh door and gave back the great crown of her head. Swear that she paid her ransom and gave her back in exchange for him. For Dumazi, the lover of her youth, washed him with pure water, anointed him with sweet oil. On the day when the Zuli comes back up, and the lapis lazuli pipe and ring come up with him, when male and female mourners come with him, the dead shall come up and smell the smoke offering. In other words, after Ishtar rises directly from the dead, she done her husband in after she rose up. One final example of the appearance of Tammuz is in the Epic of Gilgamesh. In high walled Uruk did Gilgamesh wash his matted hair and shake his locks loose over his shoulders. He bathed and cast aside his besmirched garments and donned clean apparel. In regal attire did he clothe himself and gird himself about the waist with a sash. And then did Gilgamesh place his crown upon his head. When Ishtar, goddess of love and fertility, espied the comeliness of Gilgamesh, she was overcome with longing, and did say, Come unto me, Gilgamesh, and be my bridegroom. Fill my womb with your seed. Be my husband, and I shall be your wife. For you will I harness a chariot of lapis lazuli and gold, with wheels of gold and yoke of amber. This chariot shall be drawn by a team of storm demons, in the stead of draft mules. When you enter into our temple with this sweet fragrance of cedar wood, the most excellent purification priests will kiss your feet. Kings, nobles, and sovereigns will bend the knee before you. Unto you shall they render tribute from the mountain and lowland. Your she-goat shall bear triplets, and your ewes shall bear twins. Your burden-laden donkey will outrace the unencumbered mule. Your oxen under the yoke shall have no match and your chariot steeds will garner renown for their swiftness. Gilgamesh made reply unto the goddess Ishtar in this manner, Ay, but what shall I grant you if I take you to wife? Must I provide you with perfumed unguents for your body, and fine raiment with which to clothe yourself? Would I offer you bread and victual, you who eat the food of the gods? You who drink wine meet for a king. What would be my advantage if I should take you in marriage? You are like unto a fire that goes out in the cold, a door that keeps out neither windstorm nor tempest, a palace that collapses upon those within, pitch that blackens the hand of the workman, a water skin that holds not water, a weak limestone foundation that undermines the rampart, a battering ram that fails against a foe, and a sandal that causes the wearer to trip and fall. Who of your husbands did you faithfully love for all time? Who of your little shepherds held your affection for many seasons? Forsooth, I shall now recount unto you the litany of your lovers. First was Tammuz, the consort of your maidenhead. You raised him from mere mortal to a divine. But you sent him to his doom in the netherworld, and for year after year have you decreed wailing and lamentation for him. Then comes next the gay-feathered roller-bird. You loved him, but struck him and broke his wing. Now, upon a branch in his grove of trees, does he sit and cry, My wing, my wing! Loved you also the lion, unsurpassed in strength. Yet you did dig for him seven pits, and again seven pits to entrap him. Loved you also the stallion, splendid war-horse. But you commanded for him the lash, the bridle, and the spur. 
You ordained that he should gallop without pause for seven leagues, and slake his thirst from muddied waters. And to his mother Silili, the divine mare, did you give cause for eternal weeping. The shepherd of the flock did you love. He baked for you bread each day, and each day would he slaughter a kid for you. But you smote him and transformed him into a wolf, and now his own herd boys harry him away from the flock, and his own dogs snap at his flanks. Loved you also Ishulanu, the gardener, who tended your father's date groves. He would bring you endless baskets of dates. Every day would he garnish your table with delectable viands. When you cast your eyes upon him, you were smitten with lust. You went unto him and said, O oh, my Ishulanu, let me taste of your member. Put forth your hand and caress my loins. But Ishulanu replied unto you, Me? What is it you want of me? Has my mother not baked, and have I not eaten? Why should I now eat of the bread of transgression? Why should I now eat of the bread of iniquity? And should a blanket of reeds be my only protection against the winter's cold? When you gave ear to his words, you struck him, and transformed him into a frog, and made him dwell in his own date grove, from which he cannot move nor depart. And now, since you love me, am I doomed to suffer the same fate as the others? When these words the goddess Ishtar heard, her collar was inflamed, and she grew exceeding wrathful. In a fury did she fly upward unto heaven. She hide herself before her father, Anu, lord of the gods, and her mother Antu, where she wept bitter tears. And Ishtar did then speak these words, O father, again and again does Gilgamesh disdain me. Slanderous words has he uttered about me. He does insult me with his despicable imprecations. Whereupon did Anu make reply unto Ishtar in this manner, Daughter, did you not provoke King Gilgamesh? Hence has he disdained you, and uttered slanderous words about you, and insulted you with despicable imprecations. And Ishtar spoke unto Anu thus, Father, I beseech you, grant me the bull of heaven, that I may vanquish Gilgamesh where he abides. Let the bull of heaven gorge himself upon Gilgamesh, where he abides. If you give me not the bull of heaven, I shall tear down the gates of the netherworld, and raise up the dead to devour the living. And the dead shall outnumber the living, and they shall consume the flesh of the living. Anu, lord of the gods, made answer unto Ishtar thus, If you ask of me the bull of heaven, and I unleash it, then will there be seven years of drought in the land of Uruk. For seven lean years will the farmer harvest only chaff and empty husks. Have you gathered sufficient grain for the populace? And have you gathered sufficient provender for the cattle? Ishtar spoke these words unto Anu, her father. I have already stored up sufficient grain for the populace. I have already stored up sufficient provender for the cattle. Against seven lean years have I husbanded sufficient foodstuffs for the populace and sufficient fodder for the cattle. Now render unto me the bull of heaven. With the wrath of the bull of heaven shall I slay Gilgamesh. Another example of snake-based imagery in Mesopotamia comes directly from Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was waste and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, and it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and he called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning one day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the water from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the water for which it was under the firmament from the waters, which was above the firmament, and it was sowed. What's so interesting about the word that's being used for sea or water is actually to home, and to home shares the exact same root word for Tiamat, because in the Iluma Elish, Tiamat is actually one of the many gods within the story, and often she's actually depicted as some sort of serpent or some sort of dragon within the mythology. Tiamat did more evil for prosperity than absolute. It was reported to Ah that she prepared for war. Ah listened to the report and was dumbfounded and sat in silence. 
When he pondered, and his fury subsided, he made his way to Ansar, his father, came before Ansar, the father who begat him, and began to report to him everything that Tiamat had planned. Father, Tiamat, who bore us, is rejecting us. She converted an assembly and raging out out of control. The gods have returned to her, all of them, even whom you begotten has gone over to her side. In this particular context, it seems as though that the serpent or the dragon Tiamat is fighting against the other gods with her armies. And not just that though, but also within the Illuma Elish, there's a direct reference to the Tablet of Destinies. And the Tablet of Destiny was actually referenced in the Anzu myth that pre-existed long before it was actually written down. Now there are two other examples for which I want to show like what exactly are snakes roles when it comes down to myths in Mesopotamia. Now let's go back to the Epic of Gilgamesh because there was actually a snake that was in Gilgamesh's way that tried to get the plan of immortality and he managed to do so while Gilgamesh was actually taking a bath. Bound heavy stones to his feet, they boarded the boat and launched it upon the billows. Whereupon the wife of Utanapishtim, the distant one, said unto her husband, Came Gilgamesh hither, weary and heartsick. What will you now bestow upon him, that he may take with him unto his homeland? At this Gilgamesh did employ his pole to thrust the boat close unto the shore. And Utanapishtim said unto Gilgamesh, Hither did you come, O Gilgamesh, weary and heartsick. What should I now bestow upon you, that you may take with you unto your homeland? I shall reveal unto you, O Gilgamesh, a secret. It is a hidden mystery of the gods. There be a plant very much like a thorn bush, which grows deep under the ocean. Like a rose, this plant has sharp thorns, which will prick you. Yet if your hand can procure this plant, you shall surely attain life everlasting. Upon hearing this, Gilgamesh dug a shaft deep into the ground until the abyss he did reach. He bound heavy stones to his feet, and the stones dragged him down to the depths of the seabed. There he did espy the plant. As he seized the plant, its thorns did scratch him. Then did he cut loose the heavy stones from his feet, and the sea carried him upward and cast him upon the shore. And Gilgamesh said unto Urshanabi, the ferryman, Behold this plant, Urshanabi, it is a plant of great wonder. With it a man may regain his youthful vigor. Unto high-walled Uruk shall I carry it. There will I give it to the elders to eat, in order to test its properties. The name of this plant shall be Old Man Becomes Young Man. Then will I eat the plant, that I may once again come to be a youth. Whereupon did Gilgamesh and Urshanabi set forth upon their journey. After twenty leagues they broke bread. After thirty leagues they rested for the night. And Gilgamesh perceived there a pond of cool water. He descended unto the pond and bathed in the water. But a serpent smelled the fragrance of the plant. The serpent slithered forward silently and snatched the plant. As it snaked away, the serpent sloughed off its skin. And then did Gilgamesh, when he beheld the serpent make away with the plant, sit himself upon the ground and weep. Down his cheeks did the tears flow. And Gilgamesh said unto Urshanabi, the ferryman, for what purpose, Urshanabi, have mine hands toiled? For what purpose has mine heart's blood been spent? No boon have I obtained for myself. Instead, a serpent has reaped the benefit thereof. And now do the flood tides rise for twenty leagues, because I dug a shaft deep into the ground until the abyss I did reach. How shall I now seek out the landmarks to return and find once again that plant? Let us abandon the boat upon the shore and continue our journey. One final example is Genesis chapter 3, because it says right here that now the snake was more subtle than any other beast of the field which Yahweh God has made. And he said upon the woman, Yah, ye God said, ye shall not eat any tree of the garden. And the woman said upon the serpent, of all the fruits of the tree of the garden we may eat, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, nor ye shall touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not truly die. 
For God don't know that day ye ate thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. As you guys can see, the Mesopotamian motifs surrounding the snakes for the Bible have many kind of layers. There are some elements in which the snake is seen as a positive and some motif for the mythologies. There are some mythology that show the snake as something negative. But as far as I can tell, there is no such idea of a Satan at all within that time period because such ideas did not actually develop yet until the book of Job when he started to introduce the idea to Satan within those texts because there's no such hands whatsoever to suggest that Satan and the snake are combined together until much later on within Christian theology. It wasn't until the book of Revelation, until the ideas of the snake being the devil actually became together into one place. But what do you guys think about snakes and ancient Mesopotamian stories? Tell me in the comment section down below, and as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare as you should be aware He smiles like Richard Pryor so just sit and stare It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler